Britain is a hugely diverse religious society, but of all the faiths practiced here, only one is truly British, modern pagan witchcraft, otherwise known as Wicca. Wicca is one of the fastest growing religions in the world. Its followers call themselves witches, worship a goddess of nature, and believe in the power to cast spells. Witches are among us. There's no doubt about it. A long-held presumption about us that we worship the devil. Oh, no, we don't. But the most extraordinary thing about Wicca is the story of how it was born. Because while it looks like an ancient folk religion, Wicca was actually developed in the 1940s by a middle-aged nudist from the New Forest called Gerald Gardner. In one sense, he was highly devious. He wasn't a typical founder of a religion. King of the witches, his hair goes this way, his beard goes that way. He was witchcraft. I'm Professor Ronald Hutton. As a historian of British paganism, I've been studying Wicca for over 20 years. In this film, I'm going in search of the truth about this secretive, magical faith. I want to find out how this extraordinary Englishman reinvented witchcraft, became Britain's first celebrity witch, and in the process created a new world religion. Is it not a fact that these meetings are really very largely sexual orgies? They're not, not in the least. You might not realize it, but in modern Britain, you are never far from a witch. They don't wear pointy hats, and they don't ride on broomsticks, but they do cast spells, and they definitely believe in magic. And unless we're talking about Harry Potter, a lot of people find that problematic. To the public, Wicca is often seen as mysterious, secretive, maybe even dangerous. But is this fair? I've been studying Wicca for two decades, and I have yet to be turned into a frog. But if I'm really going to understand Wicca, I need to get beyond the textbooks and get under the skin of this religion. But first, I need to find them. And as Wiccans are notoriously secretive, even that's a challenge. I've been invited to attend a ritual of a Wiccan group, which is quite an honor. Unlike other faiths, when Wiccans go to worship, they don't go to a church or a temple. They go somewhere altogether different. Modern witches are often urban creatures, but as a reverence for nature lies at the heart of their faith, they conduct their rituals in parks and woods right in the heart of the city. But despite this, you would never know they were there. As an outsider, attending this ritual is a rare privilege. To talk me through it is one of Britain's highest-ranking Wiccan priestesses, Christina Oakley Harrington. This is a gorgeous-looking place. Why have you chosen it? What are we going to do here? Well, we're in Queenswood, which has been used um, by pagans for ceremonies for decades and decades. And what we're here to do is to have um, a Wiccan-based ceremony to remember what's sacred about us and about our connection and our connection with the land and the place that we live. And it's customary in Wicca that there aren't observers, there are only participants. So I'd like to invite you to join us if you'd be willing to. I'd be honored, I'm a bit nervous. <laughs> When doing a Wiccan ritual, one feels in connection with something very, very old and connected to the earth. And those things that we find deeply moving and beautiful, the moon, the sunsets, those parts of nature that we don't understand that give us a sense of mystery and awe. May this place be blessed and sanctified. We make a Wiccan ceremony by casting a circle, and that's done with a wand. What it's like to cast a circle is to make a space that is completely within nature in order that we can leave aside those things that we have to deal with every day. But this is a place of rest. So mote it be. So mote it be. There's a part of the ceremony in which we consecrate one another. And in that moment, we're doing the balancing act, which is remembering the divinity that dwells within. So when we consecrate each other with the salt and the water, we're remembering, ah, you know, 
you're a human being in front of me, but you two are divine. Blessed be. When doing a Wiccan ritual, one feels in connection with something very, very old and very beautiful and very connected to the earth. And all the tension of all the duties and all the things that we have to carry, I just feel it just draining away. Blessed be. Blessed be. Now, I thought that was a lovely ritual. There's clearly more going on here than just a bunch of people having a good time in a wood. There's something quite deep. But does it bring me any closer to understanding what Wicca actually is? Rituals like this, with their reverence for nature, feel like the continuation of a very ancient tradition. But in fact, nothing could be further from the truth. Because Wicca doesn't have its origins in the mists of time, but in 1930s Dorset. In 1938, a 52-year-old ex-colonial gent called Gerald Gardner retired with his wife to the south coast of England. This is Highcliffe, an archetypal conservative English community with its village church, rotary club and Tory MP. But hidden just beneath the surface 75 years ago was something a lot stranger and Gerald wasn't long in finding it. For one thing, Highcliffe was a hot spot for naturists. And despite his eminently respectable appearance, Gerald liked nothing more than taking his clothes off. Well, Gardner moved to this area in 1938, and this is the house that he bought. Wow. And this is where Gerald and his naturist friends would have enjoyed the sunshine. It's almost the perfect private nudist paradise. It it's is. large, it's sunny, it's open, yet it's well hidden. Gerald had found the perfect retirement spot, and he wasn't alone. Bankers, accountants, teachers, and a host of tea and scones types seemed to be keen on retiring disgracefully. We've got extraordinary evidence of this from a rather jokey piece which appeared in the Christchurch Times in 1939. The instant success with the neighbours of the Elphinstone Road nudist colony has been marked. One old gentleman who has rented a second floor back says his outlook on life generally has entirely changed in the last few weeks. He has now no use for his car or fishing tackle and wishes to exchange them for anything useful, such as telescopes, binoculars or camera. <laughs> and also, Gardner had a darkroom built. And I think he was going to um, develop and, and print his own photographs, but it may be that they are, were of a, a naturist nature, that it's not the sort of thing you want to take along to your local chemist, um, because the, even more rumours would have spread then. He would stand out when he arrived because he would look so different. He had this um, shock of white hair. And also, what, what I remember was that he had tattoos on his arm. And I know of boys that they would cross the road because he was a bit odd looking. So even with his clothes on, Gerald seemed different. It was rumoured that his racy photo sessions went along with affairs and a taste for flagellation. But Gerald wasn't satisfied. He was seeking something stranger. And in 1939, he found it. Gerald was about to become a witch. This old house in Hampshire has a remarkable claim to fame, for it was here on a night in 1939 that a middle-aged man called Gerald Gardner was apparently initiated into witchcraft. I was blindfolded, clasped from behind, and told, I give you the password. Gerald claims that he was stripped naked, brought into a room full of witches, all similarly nude, and then given the secrets of an ancient magical religion. I was then pushed through a doorway and into the circle. And then the word Wicca was mentioned. Wicca, witch, they're witches. Witches still exist. 
From that night until his death, nearly 30 years later, Gerald Gardner devoted his life to witchcraft. He appeared in the papers and on TV. He wrote books and, crucially, he initiated others into Wicca so it would not die with him. The question is, what kind of man in 1930s England decides to become a witch? For clues about Gerald's journey to becoming Britain's most famous witch, we need to delve into his earlier life. Gerald Gardner came from a family that had made a fortune in the timber trade. He grew up in Lancashire, but at the age of six, he was packed off abroad with his nanny because of ill health, and he never went to school. Gerald Gardner was essentially an unwanted child, I think, really, because he was asthmatic and bronchitic and he was sent out to the Far East for his health. But the family never really reclaimed him. Gerald was more or less sort of left on his own uh, to learn, and he did. Gerald became very well-travelled very quickly, and as a colonial, it was natural for him to seek his fortune among the tea and rubber plantations of the Far East. But while most colonials were content to sit back and drink g and tea, Gerald went out and studied the tribal cultures of the places where he was living. In particular, he became fascinated by tribal ritual magic. One of the rituals that he attended was putting a, a, a young girl into, into trance. Disease was driven out of their bodies by spells. Magic to these tribal people was a matter-of-fact affair. It was real. Gerald says it was, it was really quite an atmosphere. It was quite unlike anything that he had seen before. Gardner's fascination with tribal magic went along with a deep interest in Western occultism. He was inspired by pioneers like Sherlock Holmes author Arthur Conan Doyle, who was heavily involved in spiritualism and had become one of the most prominent public figures in magic and the supernatural. Gerald picked up on Conan Doyle's magical world, and it wasn't long before he was following in his footsteps, experimenting with seances and spiritualism. The tribal rituals he then witnessed in Malaya only cemented this belief that magic was a powerful and very real thing. So, by the time he retired to Highcliffe, Gerald had been studying magic for decades. And he soon made contact with local occultists, in particular, a large group of Freemasons who were based nearby. He found a people who were, if not exactly like-minded, then similarly minded. There were some people who were very interested in esoteric things. There were others that were interested in nature and nature spirits. They were people who knew the local folklore. They knew the lie of the land. Those people, as he got to know, were interested in something else as well. This something else turned out to be a kind of native English version of the ritual magic Gerald had experienced in the Far East. It was real English witchcraft, and Gerald wanted in. He began taking part in magical rituals out in the New Forest. But what did witches actually do? And at this point in British history, what did it mean to call yourself a witch? As Gerald tells it, after his initiation, he and his coven began to work rituals in the New Forest, and they certainly started a tradition which continues to this very day. I've come to meet Wiccan priestess Pandora, who's going to demonstrate a ritual that Gerald and his coven would recognise. It's based on a traditional kind of healing spell, but the way it's done in a group casting a circle using certain words all comes from Gerald. So we've got some hazelnuts here in a cauldron. What we're going to do is imbue them with some of our wishes and strengths, things, things that we think we can use in the dark of the year coming. Does this actually involve casting a spell? It's exactly what we're doing. Gosh. Earth, Earth and water, water air, air and fire, charge these seeds, seeds with our desire. Earth and Natural objects, in this case hazelnuts, are charged with energy designed to cure winter ailments. And as I've got a cold, I'm hoping that it might help me. Pandora, I think I know what was going on there. It felt as if we were charging these material objects with our own spiritual energy, with the support of other spiritual entities which you'd invited to our circle. Is that kind of right, or is there more to it than that? 
The other thing to add into it too is we're adding our own energies because what we do is we take in that energy that's around us and we've pulled it into ourselves and because we've got ourselves moving, we've used that energy within us to charge these. Imagine if you can how this sort of thing would have seemed to most people in 1939. To most residents of Highcliffe, had they but known the truth, Gerald would have seemed little short of insane. But was this all madness? Or was Gerald simply following tradition? In Britain, there is a long history of useful witchcraft dating back to the Middle Ages. Known as the cunning folk, these witches would cast spells to heal the sick or bring good luck. Research has shown that Gerald essentially used these spells in his own New Forest rituals. But it was his ambition that set Gerald apart from the cunning folk of old. For him, these English folklore spells held much greater power. Gerald had ambitions to use magic on a much grander scale that would change not just your health, but the entire world. He was about to test his newfound magical powers against something truly dangerous. As just across the sea, Hitler began to threaten invasion. When he wasn't casting spells, Gerald was also a prominent member of the local home guard. And so, it made sense to Gerald to prepare to repel the Nazis, not just with rusty bayonets, but with magic. And on one night in 1940, that's exactly what he and his coven are said to have done. We were taken at night to a place in the forest where the great circle was erected. I've come to the depths of the new forest in search of the exact location of this famous magical encounter. And here to talk me through it is Gerald's biographer, Philip Heselton. Yes, hello, Ron. Glad you found it, all right. We're here because Gerald Gardner said we were taken at night to a place in the forest, and there we created the largest cone of power that we had ever attempted. What's a cone of power? Well, it's not a physical cone. It is something magical, something... a thought form, if you like. For Gerald, the threat of German invasion was the perfect opportunity to demonstrate the true power of Wiccan magic. And the great cone of power was raised and slowly directed in the general direction of Hitler. They built up power, dancing quickly round. And then when that power had reached its climax, there was this cone of power which could be seen by those who were sensitive to these things. The command was given. You cannot cross the sea. You cannot cross the sea. They rushed towards the fire, at the same time raising this cone of power and sending it over to the German high command and indeed to Hitler himself. I have to confess, although the night isn't particularly cold, I'm shivering a bit here. I got wet feet. It's pretty uncomfortable. Would it have been similarly physically exhausting for them? Well, it, yes, because they weren't in the first flush of youth, most of them. It was something which exerted them. It exerted them greatly. And Gardner says several of them died shortly after that ritual. You cannot cross the sea. You cannot come. You cannot come. This was, the, if you like, the life force of the individuals coming out. This was important to them. And they were prepared to sacrifice themselves, if necessary, in order to achieve this objective. Now, from the perspective of the present day, this story might seem utterly preposterous. Witches effectively sacrificing their lives in order to create a spell to ward off the Nazis. But Hitler didn't come, and even the British government seemed to feel threatened by the power of magic. Shortly after Gerald's Cone of Power ritual, a spiritualist called Helen Duncan was actually prosecuted for her occult activities. 
Duncan had rattled twitchy naval officers and attracted the attention of the authorities in 1944, when she held seances in Portsmouth and began answering questions about people's relatives who'd been killed in action. She had been too good at her uh, prophecies and uh, had uh, alarmed the, uh, the security forces. Uh, and in fact, she was imprisoned for uh, a while. But Gerald's passion for the occult was unwavering, and crucially, he wasn't alone. He was drawing closer to the most notorious magician in the entire world, Alistair Crowley, known as the Great Beast. Crowley was an infamous magician whose alleged black magic had earned him the title wickedest man in the world. Never far from controversy, Crowley could have a distinct dark take on the occult. I simply went over to Satan's side. I found myself as passionately eager to serve my new master as I had been to serve the old. Gerald knew Crowley's work and actually appropriated many of his magical writings in his early Wiccan rituals. But Gerald and Alistair were very different men. Where Crowley's brand of magic could be dark, Gardner was interested in the positive side of the occult. And these colorful characters gathered here at the Atlantis Bookshop which had a temple in the basement and sold rare texts with instructions on how to summon the dead, talk to angels, and wield supernatural power. It became a safe haven for like-minded people to come meet and discuss things without prejudice, and it gave them the protective colouring that at the time they needed. What sort of things happened at this shop and why do they matter to history? They matter because there were so few places that people who've been interested in this sort of thing could meet their fellows, where you could talk as equals, where you, whether you were a witch or you were a high ceremonial magician or an astrologer or a numerologist, you have always been treated as equals here. What do you think of Gerald Gardner? My father used to come home and say, he was in again today, kids, king of the witches. His hair goes this way, his beard goes that way. And he had style, he had presence, and he had a great cracking wit as well. Crowley was nearing the end of his life, and he wanted Gardner as heir to his secret occult society. But Gerald was not content with a secretive underground subculture. He wanted to take Wicker to the masses. So that's exactly what he was about to do, with a bang. Ask you, is it not a fact that these meetings are really very largely sexual orgies? They're not, not in the least. Dr. Gerald Rosso Gardner is a qualified scientist. He is also a witch. This is Gerald Gardner, appearing on the BBC's Panorama programme in 1958. Most witches are initiated quite young, and of course, they're, they're, some of them are young, some of them are middle-aged, some of them are old. Just a few years previously, Gardner had been performing spells in the New Forest with a small coven of witches. So, how on earth did Gerald make the transition from local eccentric to celebrity on the BBC's flagship current affairs programme? Gerald had come back to London in the mid-1940s full of enthusiasm about Wicca, but he had to be careful. It might be OK to discuss this stuff in the safety of the Atlantis bookshop, but the Witchcraft Act was still in force. In those days, to proclaim yourself a public witch was illegal, and to be involved in the occult made you a social pariah. In the 1940s, the core beliefs of Wicca were so radical it was a very risky religion indeed. Britain was still a very orthodox society, and anything other than Christianity was treated with suspicion. But Gerald was desperate to spread the Wiccan word, and so in 1949 he found a compromise. He adopted a pseudonym and he published a novel. And this is it, High Magic's Aid. Although it had to be disguised as a work of fiction, it is actually the first published account of Wiccan magic. 
This passage, one of many, describes how to conduct a classic Wiccan ritual. Upon the altar lay the remaining pentacle, also cords, black cloth, and other things which he would want for the operation. Taking this pentacle, he bound it with a cord and shrouded it with a cloth. It could be seen just as a, as a story, but for those in the know, you know, it was, uh, it was quite revealing. It included quite a lot of witchcraft rituals that are, are, are fairly familiar today. In some ways, it's a terrible novel. It's too many yees and, and prithies and forsooths and thous. But in essence, it's witchcraft writ large there. High Magic Aid wasn't exactly a bestseller, but it did sow the first seeds of Wicca out in the wider world. Then, in 1951, after a campaign by a group of spiritualist MPs supported by Winston Churchill, who himself had become interested in the occult, the Witchcraft Act was finally repealed. Gerald was now free to out himself as a witch and to tell the world all about Wicca, which was by now developing into a fully-fledged religious system. Since his New Forest initiation, Gerald had become something of a magpie building his new religion from many sources. He borrowed heavily from both English folklore witchcraft and modern shamanic magic for his spells and rituals, whilst the iconic symbols that would become synonymous with Wicca, most notably the pentagram, were in fact ancient symbols that had been adopted by the Freemasons. This blend of influences found expression in Gerald's collection of magical objects. But to see some of these, you have to go to a rather unlikely location. I've come here in pursuit of one of the most significant collections of Wiccan artefacts in the world. And among them is one of the most important Wiccan manuscripts of all. The owner is John Bellum Payne, a property developer now living in Spain. Please come in. Thank you. He is also one of Wicca's senior priests and, in the great tradition of the faith, has had many of Gerald's most prized magical possessions handed down to him. Wow. Can you talk me through some of Gerald's objects and explain what they were for? OK. This was Gerald Gardner's wand, or at least one of them, and he would have used that to cast a circle. The other items here that we have from Gerald is one of his athames. What is um, an athame? It's a ritual knife. We only use an athame for magical purposes. Oh, my. Obviously, uh, it's, it's phallic, so it would be used for some sort of uh, recreational purpose, I think. Other items of Gerald's are these two crowns. The priestess would wear this one of the representing the triple aspects of the moon, and this would be what he would have worn, which was, a, which was representative of the horn god. So they're representing goddess and god in the circle. Goddess and god, absolutely right. Ron, I actually think that that's your size. Would you like to try it on? If you would like me to do so, yes, by all means. Absolutely. OK. It's remarkably comfortable. Gerald was a practical sort of chap. But the real prize is much too valuable to be kept in John's basement. Worth more than a million dollars, it's locked away in a much more secure location. Now I'm being granted a remarkable privilege. I'm about to see a Wiccan Holy Grail. Here, in a secure vault in this bank is one of the most significant and valuable religious documents of the 20th century. This is the foundation text, the closest thing to a Bible, of modern pagan witchcraft. And never reveal the secrets of the art. It's called the Book of Shadows. It's Gerald's own magical workbook, his experimental notes for what Wicca would become. Here, Gerald wrote down the original rituals and spells that Wiccans have been using ever since. It's a manual, 
And like Wicca itself, it remained a work in progress rather than a fixed set of doctrines. So, Ronald, this is it. This is Gerald Gardner's first and original Book of Shadows. First of all, it's probably the most famous book that there is in, in the craft. And as far as that is concerned, my take on this book is I think it's as important as, as owning the original Bible, because it's, it's full of just everything that Gardner learned at that stage from a whole load of different sources. First, draw a circle with athene and sprinkle with exorcised water. Light candles. And this is the important part, is this is a book of experiences. This is a book about things that have gone right and some things that have gone wrong. This is wonderful. It's certainly the oldest Wiccan book surviving in Europe. It is a strange mixture, which I think is classic of Gerald. Mm. It's a mixture of a book of actual ritual to be used in the temple and read from. It's also a kind of notebook with odds and ends taken from all sorts of sources. I call upon the goddess to enlighten the hearts of all whom I call into this circle. Looking at this gives me two further insights into old Gerald. Uh, the first is just his love of beautiful things, yes. his artistry, his love of script, yeah. like his love of wands, mm. like his love of crowns, and, and also his willingness to adapt to go on from one thing to another. Mm. This is somebody who's creating a work in progress yes. which other people can pick up and with which they can do things. And move on from. Yeah. Yeah, that's the exciting thing about the craft is it never stays still. In the Book of Shadows, Gerald had written not just a guidebook to the spells and rituals of Wicca, he'd produce a manifesto for a new religion. Wicca had truly been born and now he was desperate to take it to the masses. Gerald was now a man in a hurry, desperate to ensure that Wicca didn't die with him. He'd devote the next 10 years to spreading word of it throughout the land, whatever the consequences. In 1954, Gerald published his essential guide to Wicca, Witchcraft Today. He also opened Britain's first museum of witchcraft on the Isle of Man, and he started to be featured in newspapers looking for a sensational story. Today, the people prints a report that discloses the existence of a repulsive and priestess go wild. It was after a series of muckraking tabloid features accusing Gerald of practicing black magic and devil worship that he really got his big break. Gerald was invited to defend himself on Panorama. This would become a definitive TV moment watched by millions that gave the British public their first sight of a real live witch. Is it true that the dancing takes place as a rule naked? Yes. Now why is that? It's the tradition, it's the order, the order of the goddess, who you should always be naked at my right. And of course, to work magic, you must be naked. Gerald couldn't have hoped for a bigger audience. And even in the face of some provocative questioning, he kept his dignity, just. I want to put this to you very frankly. I've been reading your book and I'm tempted to ask you, is it not a fact that these meetings are really very largely sexual orgies? They're not, not in the least. Gerald might have faced derision from the BBC, but 12 million people had just heard about Wicca for the first time. And what then happens when the circle is drawn? Well, then, of course, there's generally a starting with the dance, then there's the worship of the gods. Then, of course, it depends what they want to do. If they want to work magic, they work magic. I think Gerald felt he was a nothing less than a sacred mission, and now he had found his audience. What he was about was getting this thing planted in as many places as he could possibly bloody well plant it, because he reckoned it was, it was, it was great stuff and he wanted, it, he wanted it to survive. He's the one who put it out there and said, no, people should know about this. This is amazing. Well, thank you very much. Uh, broomsticks, I think, are all waiting. And uh, through all this, Gerald got his wish. He had become Britain's first modern celebrity witch. It's like, it's like turning the crank handle of an old car, you know. <laughs> Nothing happens then. And then suddenly it sparks into life, you know. That, that's what happened. 
As Gardner's fame grew, so too did his following. People were writing to him in their hundreds, wanting to become witches. One of his converts who joined him on Panorama was Lois Bourne. Janet, how old are you? I'm 29. And are you a hereditary witch? Well, I do have witch ancestry, but it's only within the last few years that I have been practicing witchcraft. How did you find out about Wicca? I had all these spiritual gifts and I didn't know what to do with them. And eventually I read a book by Gerald Gardner, I think it was called Witchcraft Today. And I wrote to him and I asked him if he could explain these strange things which had happened to me throughout my life. And he said, well, it's very clear to me, my dear, that you are a witch. What makes people take up witchcraft? Well, it seems to me that we live in a highly mechanised age in which many people have lost their sense of belonging. Witchcraft brings them back to living in harmony with the rhythm and the seasons of the earth and thereby helps... Why did Gerald value publicity so much? I think he was driven by something outside himself. I think this was his purpose in life. Well, I'm sh I am convinced that we all come to earth with a purpose that there is something that we have to do. And I think that this is, what, this is what Gerald's purpose was. And it wasn't just women who were drawn to Wicca. Several young men joined Gerald's original coven. One of them was Zachary Cox. His eyes were bright blue and incredibly glittery eyes. He didn't look mad in any destructive sense, but he looked kind of nicely mad, if you know what I mean. This, these were the eyes of someone who had only one foot in the, wor in the world of the commonplace. I don't know how a guy gets into that state, I'm sure, but, but he'd, he'd got into it somehow. He was witchcraft, if you like. But the really weird thing is it worked. And at the dawn of the new decade, there was something else in the air that would work in Wicca's favour, social revolution. As the 60s began to swing, Wicca's emphasis on gender equality, nature worship and sacred sexuality made a perfect fit for the historical moment. It was almost as if Gerald had predicted how the world was about to change. He was a conduit for something that it was the right time for that to happen. By the time that Gerald died in 1964, Wicca was on its way to becoming a global faith. And in America, where the counterculture was really rocking society to its core, Gerald's radical new religion exploded into a phenomenon. Throughout the 70s and 80s, Wicca continued its march into the mainstream, helped in no small part by hugely successful cult movies like The Wicker Man, which provided a tantalising, if inaccurate, glimpse of the pagan faith to cinema goers throughout the world. But as Wicca expanded across the globe, without its eccentric leader, would this very British religion flourish or perish? In Britain today, Gerald Gardner's radical religion, his feminist, eco-friendly, magical faith, has taken its place at the heart of our culture. Where once witches were persecuted and driven underground, today they can be out and proud. 21st century Wicca is plainly a far cry from its roots in the New Forest. The forthcoming census results are expected to show it well up among the top ten religions in the United Kingdom. And as the faith has grown, Wiccans have formed campaign groups. These organisations lobby the government about the ongoing recognition of Wicca and its followers' rights. One of the most prominent and active of these groups is to be found in the modern police service. I want to find out how Gerald's legacy is influencing policy and changing attitudes within some of our most respected professions. Andrew Pardy is spokesman for the Police Pagan Association. Border officer Adam Pement represents pagans in the Home Office. The format we use, the way things are laid out, was brought to us by Gerald Gardner. And when we look at it, if I look at Wicca, it's probably the only religion that England has ever given to the world. Police officers may go in and they may see an altar set up and they may not know whether the possession of a ritual knife falls underneath defences in law or not. And it's simple things like that that just make the police a bit more reassured of how they're dealing with people 
but also allows that pagan community to know that they're going to be dealt with fairly, just as any other person would. And if Gerald's legacy is becoming influential in the UK, in America, his radical English faith has infiltrated the very heart of the establishment, the US military. Roberta Stewart and Reverend Selena Fox are on a mission. Stewart's husband, Sergeant Patrick Stewart, was killed in combat last September in Afghanistan. The Nevada native was a Bronze Star and Purple Heart recipient. He was also a member of the Wiccan religion, whose symbol is the pentacle. Stewart was refused a Wiccan memorial because the authorities viewed his faith as a cult and not as a true religion. I said, where's my husband's plaque? And they indicated that the emblem of our chosen faith was not allowed to be on there. Since this test case in 2007, the Wiccan pentagram has been a religious symbol officially recognized by the US military and can be carved on the gravestones of service men and women who are killed in the line of duty. Back in the UK, Wicca's evolution shows no sign of slowing down. Indeed, it's almost certainly the fastest growing religion in the country. And what's interesting to me is that it's the younger generation that is leading the march. This is Croydon, South London. Not perhaps the most magical place on the planet. This weekend, Croydon is hosting the biggest gathering of witches in the world. I've come to Witch Fest. When Gerald Gardner wanted to find witchcraft, he had to do so by getting into a secret coven. Today's would be witches can do so at the click of a mouse. But do these young people know who Gerald Gardner was? To me, Gerald is a trailblazer and a revolutionary. He was so brave and courageous in, in embracing a religion that was so outside of the norm. He inspires me because he, he was so alive in, in his own lifetime and vibrant in that. I appreciate how he helped make it more public and, you know, we're all interested in it probably because like, of his influence within the witchcraft world. Gardner's legacy clearly lives on amongst this new generation of witches. But have modern Wiccan beliefs stayed true to the original vision of its eccentric creator? What does paganism mean to you? To me, paganism is a, is a spiritual path and it involves reverence for nature. Wicca means to me finding my spirituality embodied in a religion that is incorporating a feminine divine. What would you call it? Is it a religion to you? Is it a spirituality? Is it a craft? All three. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Yeah. It's a craft because we practice witchcraft and it's a spirituality because it's independent to how we are as individuals and how we explore it within ourselves. Whether it's nature, feminism or spirituality that inspires Gardner's young followers, Wicca is about the power of magic. Magic changed Gerald's life. It gave him a vision of a new type of religion, and it drove him to push back the boundaries of the possible. Magic does work. The fact that sun rises every morning and we're here to see it is magic. The fact that the moon glows big and bright and lights the way in the darkness is magic. And we have that, and we celebrate that, and we hold it very, very dear to our hearts. It's very difficult to define, but it's so powerful. A witch on their own can't do that much, but when they get together, they're so powerful. In the course of making this film, I've encountered many people who practice a religion called pagan witchcraft, which to them is clearly as beautiful, transcendental and effective as other faiths are to their believers and it was brought into the world by a classic English eccentric who managed to publicize a religion of lasting power. It's feminist, it's nature-centered, it seems to give people a great deal of choice. But the single most powerful idea I take away from Wicca is this. Whereas other faiths say, this is what you should feel about the divine, this one says, this is how you can feel divine.